Welcome everyone. This is lecture 15 of this series of lectures. We continue to discuss and explain my book, Manual of Fluid, Electrolyte and Acid-Based Disorders, A Pathophysiologic Approach to Common Clinical Problems. I'm Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I'm a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. This is my book. You can find more information in the description. It's available on Amazon as an ebook and also as a paperback. In the first 40 lectures, we discussed sodium in detail. And now we move to chapter 2. Today it's entirely different. We're going to talk about potassium, and chapter 2 is about hypokalemia. Let's start with an introduction, with a summary of what we're going to talk about. It's very critical to know that potassium is the predominant intracellular cation, the same way sodium is the predominant extracellular cation. Cation is a positive uh, ion, of course. Potassium is the predominant cation inside the cell. It's essential to the function of all living cells, not just human cells, any cell. Intracellular potassium concentration is over 30 times its extracellular concentration. Most of the potassium in the body is inside the cells. This is exactly the opposite of sodium. Most of the sodium is extracellular. Serum potassium is dependent on intake, how much we're eating, how much we're taking in, but also excretion in urine and stool, and transcellular distribution. We can have a shift from the intracellular compartment to the extracellular compartment and vice versa. We have to know that most of the body's potassium is in the muscles and that aldosterone is the main regulator of potassium renal excretion. I said the most important thing in sodium physiology is vasopressin, ADH, never forget that. Now with potassium, do not forget aldosterone. Aldosterone is the main regulator of renal potassium excretion. Hypokalemia is defined as serum potassium less than 3.5. It has multiple manifestations. It affects different organs. To make the diagnosis, we just need few basic laboratory tests and careful history. Most cases can be diagnosed that way. When we replace potassium, we should replace it orally, but in some situations when it is an emergency or if the patient cannot take oral, we replace it intravenously. And in other cases, we replace both. Uh, we do potassium intravenously and orally as well. Now, the first part of this chapter is talking about potassium homeostasis, about potassium physiology, about potassium pathophysiology. And I'm going to uh, talk about that in some detail because we don't need to repeat that when we talk about hyperkalemia or potassium binders. And this is going to serve us a lot when we talk about magnesium, about phosphorus, about acid base. So we're going to spend some time here. As I said, potassium is the most abundant intracellular cation. So by now you know that by heart. In humans, intracellular concentration of potassium is around 150 equivalents per liter. This is close to what? To sodium concentration extracellularly, to uh, serum, serum sodium concentration, which is, which is about 140. Now, the extracellular concentration is only 3.5 to 5. So again, it's about 30 times higher inside the cells. Hypokalemia is defined as serum potassium concentration less than 3.5 equivalents per liter or millimole per liter. It's the same when we're talking about potassium. The average intake of potassium on a Western diet is 60 to 140. It varies a lot whether the person eats fruits and vegetables. Um, and uh, when we put someone on a low potassium diet, usually it's less than 50 equivalents per day or 50 millimoles per day. This is equivalent to 2 grams per day. So a normal potassium diet, 60 to 140, a low potassium diet, about 50. Most of the potassium is excreted in the kidneys. 90% is excreted in the urine, while only 10% is excreted in the stool. This amount increases in patients on dialysis or with advanced chronic kidney disease as a compensation mechanism. Now, 
extracellular potassium is only 60 to 80 mL equivalent of the total body potassium, so only about 2%. The remaining 98% is intracellular, 3,000 to 4,000 mL equivalents or millimoles. The muscles contain the largest amount of potassium in the body, about 70%. Liver, erythrocytes, red blood cells, and bone each contain about 7%. So obviously when we get muscle damage like rhabdomyolysis, a lot of potassium is released and this is going to cause hyperkalemia. Potassium is exchanged between the extracellular and other compartments such as muscle, liver, and bone. I would like to spend some time on renal anatomy. We have really to know the nephron because these parts of the nephron we're going to mention again and again. So let's spend a few minutes, let's learn it, and uh, this will make further discussion a lot easier. Now on your screen uh, we have a picture of two nephrons. So some are short loops, okay, the one to the left, and some are long looped, the one to the right. Now as you can see when we talk about the kidney we have the cortex where the glomerulis are and then we have the medulla and the medulla we have the inner medulla and we have the outer medulla so all that is is clearly depicted on your screen now one is the glomerulus so that's obvious we don't need to spend too much time on that after that we have the proximal convoluted tubule. It's convoluted because it's, it makes all these loops and turns. And then we have number three, the proximal straight tubule. So the proximal tubule has two parts, a convoluted part and a straight part. This is followed immediately by the thick descending limb. It doesn't show clearly on this slide. Now, what matters more to us is the thin limb of the loop of Henle. So, as you can see, the loop of Henle is like a hairpin. So, it goes down and then it goes up. So, we have the thin limb. There is a descending thin limb, which is number four on our screen. And then we have the ascending thin limb, which is number five. Number six is the thick ascending limb or tau. Now this is a very important segment of the nephron. This segment is virtually impermeable to water. Water does not get absorbed here. So during our discussion in this chapter and throughout the book we're going to mention tau a lot. And tau is the thick ascending limb of Henle. Now, the uh, vasa recta, all the blood vessels around the limb of Henle are in that area, around that hairpin area, and they play a pivotal role in the countercurrent mechanism. This is the mechanism by which the kidney can concentrate the urine, where the urea can be concentrated uh, towards the inner medulla, and this is how we can concentrate the urine. Now, after the thick ascending limb, number seven, we have the macula densa. And I put a little picture to the far right of the screen of the macula densa. Now, the macula densa is an area where the afferent arteriole, the arteriole uh, you see on, this, on your screen with the arrow inside, and the efferent arteriole, and the distal convoluted tubule meet. So when these three components meet, we have this important area called macula densa. Now, the cells that line that area in the afferent arteriole are granule cells, and they make renin. It's pronounced renin and not renin. Now, the macula densa has a sensor that regulates sodium. You probably heard about glomer uh, tubular glomerular feedback and this is where that happens. So this important area is called macula densa. Now number eight is the distal convoluted tubule. So the same way we have a proximal convoluted tubule, we have a distal convoluted tubule. 
This is followed by number nine. It's called a connecting tubule. Some people call it a connecting segment. Now, when we reach number nine, we've reached the collecting tubule. And this part of the nephron has three small parts, three smaller parts. Cortical collecting duct, outer medullary collecting duct, and finally the inner medullary collecting duct. So these parts are essential to our understanding of renal anatomy, renal physiology, and renal pathology. So maybe take a screenshot, uh, try to remember them, because we'll be talking about them a lot. Here in this diagram, I simplified the nephron so we can discuss potassium absorption in the kidney along the nephron. So notice that in the proximal tubule, and here it doesn't matter the proximal convolute tubule or the, uh, pa uh, uh, the pars recta, the straight uh, part, straight proximal tubule, uh, we have 65% of filtered potassium reabsorbed in that area. The loop of Henle reabsorbs 25%, and the distal tubule reabsorbs 10%. So as you can see, in the kidney, in the nephron, potassium is filtered, and then it's completely reabsorbed. So how does potassium get into the urine? It's by secretion. Now, this is very important. I'm going to say that again. Potassium is filtered and then completely reabsorbed by the proximal tubule, loop of Henle, and the distal tubule. How does potassium get into the urine? Almost completely, almost 100% of the potassium secreted in the urine is secreted by the collecting duct, okay? And like we said, the collecting duct, we have a cortical part, a medullary part, and the medullary part can be inner or outer. Now, it is important to know that in the kidney, in the, in the cortical collecting duct, and in the uh, thick ascending limb of Henle, we have two types of cells, principal cells and intercalated cells. Let's remember those. The principal cells, what they do, they absorb sodium and get rid of potassium under the effect of aldosterone. Like I said, aldosterone is the most important factor in potassium excretion, in potassium physiology. So that's what it does. The intercalated cells, they have two types, alpha and beta. They're a mirror image of each other. They maintain acid-base balance. So this, let's remember the principal cells and the intercalated cells. Now, in this picture, we have the principal cells and the intercalated cells, an example of each. So the top one where it says PC is a principal cell. And here you can notice that to the right, we have the sodium potassium ATP's pump. So when we say pump, it means that it's going to pump something and this requires energy. It requires ATP. This pump, the sodium potassium ATP's pump, exists in all cells. Why? Because this pump concentrates potassium inside the cells and sodium outside the cells. What it does, it pumps three sodium out and let two potassium in. Okay, so it's three to two. Three sodium will go out where the gradient is higher out, and this is why we need energy, and then two potassium will go in where also the gradient is higher, and this is why we need energy. And I'm going to uh, put in a link to a YouTube video for this interesting pump. It's about two minutes. It's really worth watching. You can see um, to the left in the principal cell, you have the ROM K. This is the main potassium pump. Okay, so this is a potassium channel. This is the main potassium channel, and we're going to talk about that in, in more detail. And then you have the ENAC, the epithelial sodium channel, and under the effect of aldosterone, potassium is going to go out, is going to be excreted in the urine, and sodium is going to go in, and this is what aldosterone does. Now, below the principal cell, you can find the intercalated cell, and what, what that cell does, it maintains acid-base balance. Basically, the alpha-intercalated cells are going to get rid of hydrogen, 
Okay, so this is why we have the hydrogen ATP pump or transporter and then the hydrogen potassium ATP pump. And we are going to talk about that in much more detail when uh, we, we talk about uh, metabolic acidosis. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to end here and then we're going to uh, continue this exciting topic about potassium physiology in the next lecture.